this is our last webinar in our public health open space related to health systems transformation and the elements of transformation and it's going to be focused on community-based prevention my name is Caitlin Safford I'm the strategic policy and communications lead for health systems transformation and innovation here at the Department of Health and sitting next to me is David Hudson who is the section manager for our community-based prevention section here at the Department of Health if you'd like to say hello hello thanks for joining us today we're gonna move forward and just go over like we do every time during our webinars what open spaces are. They're intended to be opportunities for public health staff and our stakeholders to learn more about health reform and how it's being implemented and the different innovation efforts that are happening related to it. We wanted these to be safe places for people to ask questions about all of these new ideas and to really try to understand and figure out how to actually implement them within their own work. So that's what open spaces are supposed to be, just a safe, places, safe place to ask any questions you have and get some honest answers. Um, and we also wanted to impart some knowledge upon you that we have recognized as important related to health reform. We started out our open spaces by talking about the um, Healthier Washington Initiative, which is funded by the State Innovation Model Round 2 Testing Grant from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation. This was something that was started through our state health care innovation plan and now has morphed into the initiative known as Healthier Washington, which has the SIM Round 2 funding and also other funding sources and is more of a, a, a movement going forward over the next five years or so or longer to transform our health system. The three strategies that the uh, SIM grant and Healthier Washington Initiative is going to utilize are there on the left of your screen. And then in the middle, you have the different activities that are help us going to help us reach the ultimate goals of improving population health, transforming our delivery system, and reducing per capita spending related to health care. But we wanted to start focusing our open spaces beyond just the state innovation model and the Healthier Washington Initiative. So we started this series on the elements of transformation. We began with insurance and coverage reform and we in ended up about three months later all the way down to the community-based prevention element, which we'll be going over today. We want to define the triple aim for everyone who hasn't possibly heard of it. Uh, this is something that is the sort of theory behind why we needed the ACA to begin with, recognizing that our health system was a little broken and Donald Berwick came up with this theory of how we need to transform it. First, we need to have better health and we need to have better care, better quality of care, and if those are done, then our costs will also be lowered. So what does better health really mean? It's related to health promotion and making sure people understand how to get healthier. And it's also re related to changing the environment they operate in so they can actually be healthier without having to try too hard at it. And we also needed to address different health disparities that occur, recognizing that not everyone has equal opportunity to be healthy. Better care means more coordinated care that's safe, effective, patient-centered, and timely, and also accessible. We, again, wanted to make sure that all of this care is also equitable. The quality of care is equitable across all populations in all areas of our state. And these, having, being able to do all of these things uh, as well as doing other things related to reducing costs. We want to be able to lower costs. We need to reduce unnecessary services that are asked for or tests that are done. Um, we also need to reduce redundant services that are happening. We need to be focusing more on, on preventable conditions and preventable ser prevent prevention related services that we can offer. And we need to also look at different payment models for how we pay for our care, which we talked about some. And um, we really tried to frame all of our webinars, our, our elements webinars around the triple aim so that everyone understands that triple aim is kind of embedded throughout all elements. So this particular session we're going to be focusing on community-based prevention we wanted to provide an overview of community-based prevention provisions that are in the affordable care act an update on some implementation efforts related to community-based prevention in the aca here in the state and then share some roles and opportunities for public health and some ideas about how um, everyone in public health can sort of get involved and our stakeholders can work together to promote better uh, prevention across our communities so we're going to get started. 
community-based prevention. We're just going to provide an overview. We found a def we did find a definition of what community-based prevention is. They're designed to reach people outside of traditional healthcare settings, and these settings may include schools or work sites, healthcare facilities, faith-based settings, farmers markets or retail centers, parks and communities. And these programs um, combine multiple settings to have a greater impact than programs using only one setting. So being able to sort of hit prevention at all different levels so that you can have as much access as possible to preventive services and programs. <clears throat> we do have a section here at the Department of Health when the Office of Healthy Communities was first formed. Um, the director at that point recognized that community-based prevention was going to be a focal point of how we move forward and transform our health system. So we set up a section, the community-based prevention section, which we have the section manager of here today. And we just wanted to introduce it so everyone know and is aware that we have a section like this that can, can be called on if needed. These are some of the programs that are actually in that section doing work around community-based prevention at the state and local level. We're gonna talk a little bit about the implementation of community-based prevention related to the ACA. So there were several different prevention initiatives in the Affordable Care Act. I think what a lot of people get lost around the Affordable Care Act is either it's about insurance or about all of this innovation work when there was actually a significant amount of funding built into the Affordable Care Act to work on prevention programs. So for the first time, there was a prevention and public health fund set up that was funded. This was one of the first national public health and prevention funds that was ever funded. Um, and although it has been sort of stripped of a lot of its funding now, at the time it was really innovative and transformative. So one of the first grants that was out of there was the community transformation grants, which our state did receive, um, and that ended in 2014. Another example of an initiative was the National Diabetes Prevention Program. And there were several immunization grants that came out of here. Carrie Comer, our colleague here on the Health Systems Transformation and Innovation Team, used to work on one of those grants, helping local health jurisdictions set up billing mechanisms to bill for services. A lot of falls prevention funding came out of the Affordable Care Act to help prevent falls in all populations, but particularly in elderly populations, since that is a high cost driver for health systems. And the nutrition labeling at chain restaurants is just a, an example of a sort of more specific initiative that was funded out of the Public Health and Prevention Fund, or Prevention and Public Health Fund. The National Prevention Health Promotion and Health Council, we're going to go over this a little bit. It was set up in the Affordable Care Act to actually drive the National Prevention Strategy, which I know may, some of you may know that we actually have a whole stra strategy now devoted to prevention. <clears throat> there were also some maternal, infant, and early childhood home visitation programs set up. The program that I used to work in, the Personal Responsibility Education Program, which is related to providing evidence-based sexual health education to adolescents in states across the country. Actually, almost every state has this funding. The Pregnancy Assistance Fund was also established to help teen mothers uh, be able to carry on with their lives and support them in being parents and help them get past and get to more educational goals and career goals while also supporting them as parents to their children. And then the essential health benefits, although not necessarily a program that was set up, but there was a lot of focus on prevention within the essential health benefits in the Affordable Care Act, which we'll go over just briefly. I know we've covered that before. So talking us a little bit about the Prevention and Public Health Fund, it, it provides expanded and sustained national investments in prevention and public health, the goal of which is to pr improve health outcomes and to enhance health care quality. It invested in a broad range of evidence-based activities, including community and clinical prevention initiatives, research and surveillance and tracking, public health infrastructure was a big piece of this fund, immunizations and screening, tobacco prevention, and then also trying to figure out how to uh, bolster the public health workforce with, and training um, and do quality improvement efforts within public health to promote prevention. So I mentioned just previously the National Prevention Council, which was established by the Affordable Care Act. This council was designed to prioritize and align prevention activities that were happening across um, all of the federal agencies and at the state levels, and it's chaired by the Surgeon General. Currently, the council has 20 federal departments in its membership base and an advisory group of 25 non-federal members. 
And what this council was tasked with, with doing was to create a national prevention strategy. This strategy had four strategic directions and then seven priorities it focused on. It also had recommendations and sample actions that can be taken under each priority. And then it provided some key indicators for us to measure our progress that was, being, uh, that was happening in each priority. This is a graphic of what those uh, directions and um, priorities were. So in the middle, you have the ultimate goal of the National Prevention Strategy, which is to increase the number of Americans who are healthy at every stage of life. <clears throat> and then the four strategic directions are healthy and safe community environments, clinical and community preventive services, elimination of health disparities, and empowered people. And in order to get there, they wanted to focus on the seven priorities that are ringing this uh, graphic. Tobacco-free living, preventing drug abuse and ex excessive alcohol use, healthy eating, active living, mental and emotional well-being, reproductive and sexual health, and injury and violence-free living. So we've covered this in multiple sessions, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but the big thing we wanted to point out was the preventive and wellness services. Um, this was a cornerstone of the essential health benefits. This is what people believe is going to help drive lower costs and better quality of care that people um, actually receive in the health setting. Additionally, it will lead to better health, which, so this was, the preventive and wellness services category was meant to sort of achieve the triple aim in, in full. <clears throat> there are several, um, there have been several issues with actually implementing this particular category, which we have been working on both at the state level with our Office of Insurance Commissioner and then at the national level. There's a lot of work going on so that it's interpreted in the way that it was supposed to be interpreted. But the United States Prevention Services Task Force, the USPSTF, was um, set up to provide recommendations related to the preventive and wellness services. So they provide a clinical direction for how what screenings are covered under certain insurance or should be covered under the insurance benefit of preventive and wellness services. There's quite a few of them and there are four agencies that actually contribute to those preventive services. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to David Hudson, who is the section manager for our community-based prevention section here, and he's going to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the funding sources that our state received and how they were implemented. David? So thanks, Caitlin. Um, I'm going to talk first about two of our grants that are funded by the CDC, and this funding is part of the Prevention and Public Health Funds from Health and Human Services from the federal government. And I think it's important to note that these two grants are very closely linked. And uh, you can see the long names on this slide, but we uh, actually refer to them as 1422 and 1305. Um, and although the state is obviously supporting these grants and providing technical assistance and resources, it's really the work in the communities that is implementing um, these prevention strategies. And as Caitlin said, it's in various uh, settings, whether it's health systems, schools, communities, and work sites. So in terms of the 1422 grant, um, these are the areas that we're focused in on. And again, uh, most of our work is really focused on policy, systems, and environmental change. One example for policies would be nutrition guidelines, whether that's in schools or work sites. Um, community clinical linkages, so really looking at some of the social determinants of health when the services that are out there in the community, uh, addressing issues like poverty, food insecurity, affordable housing, and making sure that there's bi-directional referrals with the work that we're doing around prevention and some of these social determinants of health. And at the bottom of this screen, it lists the uh, communities that are actually funded, um, and we call them community lead organizations. And there's a couple changes to this. The second, Better Help Together, is uh, seven counties in eastern Washington. It's based in Spokane. And the second one, actually, the name should be Olympic Health Action Network, and that's three counties, Kitsap, Jefferson, and Clallam. And then um, Tacoma, Pierce County, the Healthy Living Collaborative of Southwest Washington, based in Vancouver, 
and then finally a north central community and along with grant county it also includes kittitas douglas chelan and okanagan so in terms of the 1305 this is um very closely linked to 1422 not to be make it too confusing with the numbers that we use for these grades or these these grants but the focus area of this grant is on obesity diabetes heart disease school health and then a patient-centered medical home and this grant really builds on and supports the state's comprehensive and integrated approach to create and sustain healthy communities and I think the important term there is sustaining and that's why we're focused on policy systems and environmental change because that's a real more it's a more sustainable approach as in terms of programmatic work or just providing education so now I'm going to introduce Elisa Solberg who hopefully will be able to um, talk with you all through the phone she's in a different location and she's the executive director of the Point Defiance AIDS project up in Pierce County so Elisa if you can uh, unmute your phone and then it's it's your slides and I'll just let me know when you want to go to the next slide and I'll forward it on uh, hello everyone uh, thank you for having me uh, about uh, two years ago my agency began to see the writing on the wall not not at the depth that David and Caitlin just described but we began to see tremendous opportunity for the expansion of community health and for our access to care for the people that my agency serves. And you're seeing the slide that says surrender change. My point design phase projects uh, operate the Tacoma Needle Exchange Program and our um, catchment area is Pierce County. Uh, so with, with all the changes we saw coming, we began to analyze uh, ways that we could adapt our agency to meet those, the changes. Uh, a little bit of background about my program. The Tacoma Needle Exchange Program has been in operation in Pierce County since 1988. And like so many other community-based organizations, has developed a really um, deep and trusted relationship within the community. Um, this relationship uh, gives us the opportunity to engage with vulnerable people, many of whom have behavioral health challenges or dealing with past and current trauma, uh, and are often the high utilizers of emergency services that we're hearing so much about. Um, we, we get a chance to see these folks at a point on the care continuum before they present to chemical dependency agencies or in the emergency room. And I've been working with a woman uh, who is working in the healthcare transformation landscape in Oregon. That's very interesting because she's been talking to me about um, how there they are putting screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment for alcohol use into, um, into practice at, at dentist offices because they recognize this, this opportunity upriver to engage with people who um, who may be uh, at risk and uh, to, to help improve their health outcomes um, over time. And that, that is a, that's a unique opportunity as um, many of the community-based organizations have that unique, unique opportunity as well. So traditionally, uh, our focus of the Tacoma Needle Exchange Program has been the prevention of HIV and hepatitis C, but we realized with the Medicaid expansion that we could capitalize on the access point, that unique access point to, the, to vulnerable people um, to provide other prevention activities that address health concerns affecting our participants. And these are, that's the middle row, sort of in the slide. Um, it includes um, wound care. Um, and in particular, um, what we see is that if we can give people the ability to care for themselves, the tools and the, and the education and the knowledge to care for themselves, to prevent wounds or to care for wounds, that they don't end up in the emergency room with um, wound botulism or necrotizing fasciitis, so conditions that are quite costly to the healthcare system. Um, they also include overdose prevention, mental health crisis intervention, assistance with health insurance enrollment, and health literacy. Uh, so this addresses the social determinants of health. But what we find is that many people that we serve they don't have access to computers or internet or and they have difficulty navigating or understanding a, a really fractured healthcare system and so um, we found that we can in many ways um, 
reinterpret or um, help people to understand their benefits and how to navigate and where to find a, um, you know, an appropriate primary care provider. Um, we're, we're also, um, for folks who require a little additional help, we are uh, providing linkage, more intensive linkage to care. So transportation, we may actually escort folks who are, uh, who may have been mistreated by primary care providers in the past who don't understand how to care for the Medicaid population and maybe, um, you know, um, have some anxiety in approaching a new provider, uh, we will escort them to their appointment so that to, to try to reduce that, that anxiety and help them through the process. Um, really, these are new services to us, but what we're doing is, is approach, we're, we're taking a team-based care approach. Um, oftentimes, uh, we will be able to bring uh, providers together from housing, you know, housing advocates and uh, mental health and uh, chemical dependency providers into, a, into, a, into one room so that we can provide coordinated care and, and, perhaps, and, and what we found is that that improves the health outcome for that, that person. So uh, next slide, please. And this is very much the same slide as the slide before, but uh, Carrie asked me to talk about uh, a little bit about our partnership. And first, I'd just like to say that uh, public health, both Department of Health and local public health, are just, they're extremely instrumental partners for community-based organizations uh, in this transformation process. Um, in many ways, the system is just not ready to partner with community-based organizations uh, and we're not, and community-based organizations are not ready to partner with the system. We see the opportunity. We, we understand that uh, clinics and hospitals and health departments may not want to or have the ability to recreate an outreach arm or to create an outreach arm from, from scratch. And many community-based organizations have that, that embedded relationship in the community already. They've been doing the work. Uh, so why not partner uh, to um, increase the efficiency of the system, but still the system is not quite ready for that kind of partnership. And um, uh, to be a little more specific about that, what I've experienced is that there are questions and uncertainties around sharing of resources and liability. Um, and, and, and how do partners... Um, how do how can we partner to uh, provide clinical oversight for an agency that that hasn't traditionally had clinical oversight? Uh, and so to, to provide this component uh, to reduce costs. One great example of this for us is that we have been able to develop a relationship with the Department of Health and the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department to provide hepatitis C testing at our site. So the Department of Health provides the test and the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department provides the oversight for our non-clinical staff to conduct hepatitis C testing on outreach. Uh, so the agreement enables us to, to provide non-traditional access to that testing in a non-traditional setting that's convenient for our participants. Uh, so it increases the testing rate without adding additional clinical costs to our budget, which would be prohibitive to us. Uh, so and and. For me, that is the triple aim in a nutshell. Um, that kind of partnership um, enables us to help the health department reach their goals uh, and, and doesn't add additional costs to the system. So another example um, of our partnerships, uh, recent partnerships, is that we are working with the Medical Reserve Corps to provide a wound care clinic on site at Needle Exchange. And as I talked about earlier, if we can give people the ability to uh, care for themselves um, and to increase their own um, their own efficacy for their care, uh, then they don't end up in the, in the emergency room. The Medical Reserve Corps, in our case, is also hasn't started doing this yet, but we see the, the potential for them to provide immunization. And um, uh, we, we talked earlier about obesity, that, that that's one of the national um, focuses. And, so body mass index screenings and hypertension screenings, those are all things that can be done um, 
at, at that access point that's convenient to the people that we serve. Uh, and then finally, we have a, are just establishing a memorandum of understanding with MultiCare's uh, Behavioral Health Unit, uh, and that will give us the ability to do screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, and uh, chemical dependency assessment, again, on-site in a convenient, non-traditional setting. Uh, really what we find is that it's difficult to, to send people across town to talk about something um, like chemical dependency assessment cold, for them to walk into another agency cold. It's, it's oftentimes better for us to use our relationship um, that's already been established in a convenient set setting uh, again, increasing the ability for us to, to um, complete the assessments. Uh, and, then, and then just a final word um, about some of the opportunities for community-based organizations to be involved in the innovation happening at the behavioral health organization level and the accountable community of health uh, level. Um, CDOs already have the, the they, we already provide similar services to the care coordination uh, services spelled out by the healthcare authority and now being recommended by Medicaid. Um, and given that community health workers at most community-based organizations already have that established relationship with vulnerable populations, it, it just makes sense that the system would partner with these agencies rather than creating a whole other level of services, um, oftentimes at the managed care organization where linkage to the community may not uh, be as strong. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you so much. I hope I was able to provide some ideas about opportunities to expand a community-based health care. Thanks, Lisa. And we're going to um, go into a couple more of the sort of concepts that are happening specifically in roles for public health or community-based organizations or both. Uh, so if you have any more thoughts, you'll have another opportunity to share with us. And I appreciate you, both you and David, bringing this up because we really wanted to highlight the work that's happening both at the state level and at the local level to show that you have to do them in conjunction if we're going to actual, actually create true systems change around prevention. So I really appreciate that. We just need to get as much word out there as possible about all the work that's happening because there are so many partners. So to really know uh, who's doing what is important. Oh, thank you. So thank you. We're going to move on to talking a little bit about public health role. And whenever we talk about this, we're all defining public health very broadly. Sometimes it means at the state level. Sometimes it means and not always done by our agency. Sometimes public health is done by other agencies. Um, also at the local level, done by community organizations like Elisa's or done by our local health jurisdictions out in the counties. And so we just wanted to bring up a couple of concepts that are occurring. We all are fairly aware, if you've been tuning in to several of our webinars, about the accountable communities of health. In the actual state innovation model testing grant application, this was named the Community Empowerment and Accountability Investment, which is actually a really empowering name. I think that it was um, supposed to, meant to sort of give people, the, give communities the feeling of being able to bring up work on their own and, and actually transform their region. <clears throat> So I wanted to just talk briefly about what this is and then maybe get David's and Elisa's thoughts on how local uh, organizations or individuals can get involved with their ACHs. Um, so mostly, most of the grants that are occurring right now, first of all, we'll say, like we always have been saying, the accountable communities of health are not designated yet. And so there's a lot of work going on regionally to get them set up and to get governance structures in place to actually help them operate when we go live hopefully next year um, but there are no officially designated accountable communities of health there are two pilots that are occurring currently that's uh, being funded by some legislative uh, legislative directed funds out of last year's budget um, but there are no designated ones so hopefully those pilots will help us show help show us what actual criteria is needed for the designation criteria for the ACHs but they aren't actual ACHs yet so just so everyone is aware and this was intended this particular investment was intended to really encourage new and improved relationships between all the different health the sectors of the health system so you have the community-based organizations you have public health and you have 
um, healthcare organizations and then you have insurance and they're all kind of operating in their silos. And so the ACHs and the regions are really meant to break down those silos and help people operate on a equal level, level, understanding that they all have an impact on the health of the people in the region. One of the biggest things that is going to be successful in driving the ACHs is data. And we're having some challenges with this right now. Our data is um, sort of broken across the system, the way that we transmit data, the way that we collect data, it's all different. We house data differently. A lot of data systems can't talk to each other, whether they're electronic health record data or their actual uh, collection systems that the state uses to collect data. They can't talk to each other. You have to have extensive data sharing agreements in place to be able to share the data across different agencies. That needs to change if we're going to be able to understand and measure the impact we're having on communities. And a lot of these communities are really crying out for data to even understand where they are right now and they can't get a full picture of that. So there's a lot of work being done at the state infrastructure level to sort of figure this out. But there has also been some discussions about whether or not there need to be regional data warehouses created so that they have more accessible access to local data. So those are some of the things that are sort of um, on the precipice related to ACHs. And I just wanted to give David and Elisa a chance to uh, have any thoughts that they had about how the state or uh, different grants that we operate here at the state level can get involved with the ACHs and how it sort of works together. So David, I'm going to give you a shot first. Sure. So I would just uh, kind of reiterate what Elisa was saying earlier, the importance of uh, partnerships in this work. And I think it expands not just between public health and health systems, but um, I talked earlier about addressing some of the social determinants of health. So we might not think that affordable housing is an issue that is related to prevention, but we know in terms of the communities that we're trying to reach that are the most vulnerable, that we're hearing from them in many parts of the state that um, it's really one of their biggest concerns. And we know, again, hearing directly from them that until we address that, they really can't focus on living a healthy lifestyle. So I just can't stress enough how much these partnerships um, with organizations that are addressing these issues and then when we look at our multi-sector partners like academia and nonprofits um, and you know um, government obviously we all play a role and in, uh, in working together towards better health outcomes Elisa do you have any thoughts about you've already mentioned a little bit about getting involved with the accountable communities of health and, and the behavioral health organization in your area but any other thoughts about how people can sort of bring their voice to the table? Yes, I, um, thank you. I, I think that, um, you know, so traditionally I have waited to be invited to the table and um, there is so much going on and, and people, there's, there's just a lot of information happening and, and many changes and so I think that you can't wait to be invited. You, ha you have to, um, we know who our um, lead agencies are across the state. I, I believe it's published at the Healthcare Authority website, uh, if you don't know. Um, and, and so as a community-based organization, there are lots of opportunities through, um, for example, in Pierce County, there was a uh, community health worker subcommittee that reported to the Accountable Community of Health, and that's how I got involved. Um, but I, but I invited myself to the table, so don't be shy. Uh, <laughs> and then the partnerships, I, 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 I don't want to give the impression that the partnerships are impossible. It's not impossible to develop these partnerships. It's just that I think we, none of us have flexed these muscles before, uh, quite in this way. And so it, it's entirely possible. It just takes time and patience and effort and finding people within the agencies that you want to partner with uh, who who understand and who um, are maybe willing to think outside the box a little bit. Um, many of the agencies that are partnering are, uh, but as you said, they're siloed. They are, they have hierarchical structures that sometimes don't allow them to really think outside the box or act in ways that innovation requires and so finding the people that that are comfortable doing that being a little more flexible is, is vital um, and so and um, and I think one last thing 
uh, engaging with the behavioral health organizations and the accountable communities of health takes time in understanding the language so that we know that we're using the same definitions and phrases. And so that has been a real uh, uh, eye-opener and learning experience for me is to really make sure that I understand what the outcome measures are, what what um, what are the goals? What are the what are the initiatives? What are the what are the outcomes that you want to help your partners achieve? Um, so that kind of analysis is really important. Great, thank you, Elisa and David. I appreciate your thoughts, and they're both well, uh, well, on point for what the accountable communities of health really need. And this is why we need more partners at the table than the traditional partners that are there, um, sort of all the time. So we want to move on to another concept, the policy systems and environment changes. I think that this has gotten a lot of sort of um, more light brought to it since the Affordable Care Act was passed. It's sort of been a cornerstone approach to how we do community work. And it's actually related to a specific theory around social ecological model of changing health behaviors. And this particular model recognizes that there are multiple influences and drivers of specific health behaviors and that they need to be addressed at several different levels if you're actually going to change that behavior. And so they're, they have a whole pyramid of what those levels look like, but they're interpersonal, interpersonal, organizations, community, and public policy levels. So in being able to approach it from the policy systems and environment you're going to actually create a change that's to create healthy populations. <clears throat> so many of the grants that were funded out of the Affordable Care Act that we've mentioned here actually require the implementation of strategies related to PSE, as it's affectionately called, when addressing certain behavior change. So specifically related to healthy eating or active living or uh, tobacco prevention, a lot of that requires um, policy systems and environment changes. I think this is going to be a key point for how the, the accountable communities of health are also going to be able to drive behavior change in their areas, and it's going to take an understanding of this approach from all sectors to really make that change, um, which is something that public health can really push on to, not push, but suggest on to healthcare organizations and health insurance companies who may not be as familiar with what PSE means and, the, and how, to, how to actually implement it. We wanted to provide an a couple of examples, one of which is um, of a policy change that helped to change behavior is getting hospitals and business businesses to actually adopt no smoking policies. That's a change, a policy, local level policy change that happened that actually changed the behavior and how much smoking occurred on site at those areas. <clears throat> I also, David had some thoughts as well that he wanted to share about PSEs. This is his um, sort of expertise topic. So please, please, David. Sure. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about why we focus on PSCs versus programmatic uh, work. And it includes that it creates culture change much more effectively. It uh, affects everyone in a particular setting, whether, again, that's a work site, a community, or a school. When you implement a policy or you implement an environmental change, which we also call physical infrastructure, changes it's obviously less costly and therefore it's more sustainable over time so an example of an environmental change uh, could be something like uh, new sidewalks or crosswalks but it also could be in work sites where they have available a, a blood pressure self uh, measuring device and then a systems change example would be in a school cafeteria where they move the salad bar to the front of the line. It seems like a simple thing, but it's actually much more effective in getting kids to eat more fruits and vegetables. And then another best practice would be to schedule recess before lunch. Great, thank you. So, Elisa, was there anything you would like to add to this particular slide? I know I'm sort of springing it on you. Um, so if, if we can just move on to if you'd rather. Oh, no, I don't have anything to add. Thank you, though. Great, thank you. So the last one we want to cover, community clinical linkages. This is something that I think um, a lot of people have heard of uh, in the last probably decade or so. A lot more attention has been brought to this. It's also affectionately called CCL, so I might reference it like that, since community clinical linkages is kind of a mouthful. So this particular, I wanted to define it for everyone. And their connections between community and clinical sectors to improve population health. An example of a, of a linkage that we're talking about is 
to help ensure that people with or who are at a high risk of chronic disease actually have access to community resources that help support or prevent, delay, or manage these conditions. So if somebody is at high risk or has been um, told that they have diabetes, that they are able to get community resources that help support them in managing that disease or help support them in preventing actual occurrence of the, of the chronic disease. <clears throat> there's a, there's several different programs in our state that are actually great successes of community clinical linkages. There are 25 diabetes prevention programs, and these are evidence-based programs that are considered, and this is a quote from a report that I read recently, to be the gold standard treatment for diabetes in order to prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes. What the program really does is it assesses a person's risk of developing diabetes, and then they have testing available on site for where you're at <clears throat> to really understand what your risk level is. For those that are at higher risk um, and, and considered to be pre-diabetes, they're enrolled in a one-year curricula-based program that teaches ways to reduce the chance of developing diabetes. And this is, evidence has shown this has actually been proven to work and help prevent diabetes. <clears throat> so community clinical linkages in general are supposed to be bi-directional referrals. So it's not just about clinics then ref referring people out to community resources. It's also about when a community resource sees somebody in pain or in trouble, um, they can direct them to the clinic. So it's being able to have both sectors recognizing who can do what and having the um, communication and partnership done between both sectors to do those bi-directional referrals. Elisa, I wanted to give you a shot at doing some, um, any thoughts you had on community clinical linkages since this is a, a large piece of what you do in your organization. Oh yes, I think uh, this is something that we're just learning about now, but the power of it is really, is, is really impressive. So um, I think as I, I mentioned earlier, we're, we're taking sort of a team-based approach. So in one circumstance just recently, we were able to sit down with the housing, the person, um, the person's housing advocate, the the um, the mental health person, and the person that was that was in charge of their um, substance use uh, treatment. And what we found is that we, in that conversation, we were each able to provide pieces of uh, something that had uh, was sort of a mystery to us in moving forward with their with with success in their personal care plan. And, but sitting down together, the four uh, components, um, and, and I think that you know you're, you're talking about bi-directional referrals, and this is more of a real-time for people sitting down together and discussing how to get past a barrier. Uh, and and it was it was a, an amazingly powerful circumstance where where the four people uh, present were able to to find the resolution and move forward to a successful outcome. So. Uh, I think, and, and as David said earlier, it, it's beyond um, uh, primary care mental health. It, it goes to housing. It goes to nutrition. It goes to um, other circumstances. It goes to uh, really understanding uh, what a person is dealing with when they've been chronically homeless for a decade. and. And do we need to bring an occupational therapist in um, to help that person be supported through learning how to live indoors again? So it, it, it really is uh, multi-dimensional, and and I hope that that that, that uh, addresses what you're talking about. Um, it's, it's 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 extremely powerful. Yes, that was great, Elisa. It was perfect. I think you brought up a really good point that it's not necessarily about, you have to start somewhere and to be able to create those bi-directional referrals, you have to bring everybody to the table to really understand what your goal is. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Do you want to share something? Yeah, okay. I'm fine. Okay, we're going to end the webinar now because we're a little bit over time. Um, I will give everyone a little bit of an update about what's going on here at the state level. So this was our last series of webinars. We're trying to figure out what our path is moving forward. As we announced a couple months ago, funding for our particular team um, was cut. And so we don't know exactly what that looks like yet and what the structure for support around health systems transformation will be at the, at the state level. Uh, both for our state employees and for our local public health um, local public health partners and community partners. So <clears throat> there, tune in, more will be shared. 
at some point you will be able to hear and understand what the structure is going to look like here, but we don't have anything for you right now. So thank you for attending all of these series of webinars. We really appreciate it. We hope that they have been helpful um, and at least have gotten your juices flowing around different ways that you can approach uh, the Affordable Care Act implementation and all of the innovation work that's happening at the state level and at local communities. So thank you everyone and have a great day.